everyone. It's that time once again. It's time for Catalog and Cocktails. It's your weekly, honest, no BS, non-salesy conversation about enterprise data management with tasty, 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 tasty <laughs> beverages in hand. Uh, my name is Tim Gasper. I'm a longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World and joined by Juan Cicada. Hey, Tim. It's uh, here. I'm Juan Cicada. I'm the principal scientist at Data.World and always excited to take the break. Middle of the week. End of the day. I'm actually right now in San Diego. So it's two o'clock when it's usually four o'clock. I do this. Yeah, you're West Coast this time. West Coast this week. But actually, I'll, 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 I'm going to do some work a little bit after this. So, um, And today we have a very special guest and it is a person who has really seen a lot in the data world. Uh, this is Kelly Wright, who is the president and CEO at Gong and is a former EVP of sales at Tableau. Uh, one of the things I really love about Gong, which is a tool that is a revenue intelligence platform that we use at data.world, is that they collect and they do so much stuff with data. Like what, you have to go read Gong's blog to go see all the analysis that they do. I mean, you learn so much from that. And it's just an example of how to go do things with data and how to be uh, take that to the next level. Kelly, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Okay. For it's, it's so great to be here. Thank you, Tim and Juan, for having me. And thanks for the commercial for Gong. It's great that we have our raving fans right here on the call. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay, we're not supposed to be salesy, but Kong is, is a really cool tool. I'll say that. So it's oh, cool so. for the data. <laughs> All about the data. It is. We unlock reality in that data. We're going to be talking about that data today, I understand. Yes, yes. So let's start off with our tell and toast. So, what are we drinking and what are we toasting for, Kelly? Oh, well, let's see. Mine is very exciting. I am in a hotel room in Napa at an off site, and I am drinking water it is hard and real but here it is my water it's pretty early here on the west coast at two to start drinking a happy hour the wine's coming later yes yes <laughs> how about you tim i am drinking a little bit of glen Murray 15 some scotch so that's what's on the menu today so not a cocktail keeping it really simple just just some scotch <laughs> And I think today is the first time, which I'm not having a cocktail. I actually have a beer here with me, which is my, one of my favorite beers, Stella. It is, uh, yeah, it's 2 p.m. here on the West Coast. But I have to say, I'm in San Diego, and I can see this beach right in front of me over here. It's beautiful, and I, I just I just feel like one having a beer right now. And I'm toasting because I'm at a conference. I'm actually right now at DGIQ, and it's just fascinating to be back in person. Uh, and I'm really excited. I'm going to shout out. I met a big fan somebody who actually came up to us it was so we i met with people who actually listened to the podcast and then i want to shout out to cody pastini that she is like was a super fan and has been watching all our episodes so hey thank you so much this is really cool to go meet people who are actually listening to us and i think we have cool things to say so yeah thanks um, cody so all right we got we got our warm-up funny question here so uh the gong show was a popular tv talent show in the 70s what was your favorite game show growing up the Gong Show. Did you bring that up because I work for Gong? <laughs> yeah, we always that. So this that's is the tie-in. Uh, exactly. We have our producers who come in. They organize the whole abstract and put in the funny, the funny question. So that's where I it comes got. From. It. You know, I think my favorite game show was Wheel of Fortune. I loved figuring out the the little phrases all the time. So. <laughs> How about you, Jim? Uh, Jim, I said Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, uh, yeah, you know, I I loved Wheel of Fortune a lot as well, and I and and I also really loved uh, Jeopardy. Like, and I feel like one was always after the other, or whatever, because like uh, you know it was like okay, let's watch them spin the wheel, then let's do some trivia. So that was always a lot of fun growing up. That was my toss up. Everyone in my house liked a Jeopardy, but I wasn't nearly as good as Jeopardy as I was at Wheel of Fortune. So. <laughs> I wasn't very good at answering the questions, but it was still fun. <laughs> well, as a kid, Nickelodeon. <laughs> Nickelodeon had a bunch of these uh, game shows. I mean, so many of them. I remember just, I mean, I have, it's a blur right now, but Nickelodeon. Yeah. And I do want to shout out. Running there. around and the, the, the slime and the comes slime down and all that kind of stuff. All, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then there's also the American Ninja Warrior, and that's a shout out to one of the our, the founders of Data World, Matt Lessig, who was a I think nine time participant American Ninja Warrior. Like that, that's another cool show to go see. So yeah. All right, well let's kick it off with with our honest uh, no BS discussion here. So um, 
when people say we want to be data driven and they're like, oh, I'm going to go buy all these apps and now I'm data driven. It's like, no, that's not really it. And so when we talk about having a, having a data driven enterprise, why does it still sound like a pipe dream? Like you would imagine that we can actually be very data driven right now, but it seems like we're not. Or are we like how, how you've seen this evolution of data for so long? Like, where are we right now? Yeah, well, I, I think actually some people don't think it's a pipe dream. They actually think that they're data driven, their company's data driven. But there's a difference between our companies being data driven by just collecting and storing the data, or do they really have a data driven culture and a data driven enterprise? And those are two different things. And there's been this huge evolution in the whole data ecosystem that we've seen over the last couple of decades. It's probably worth one chatting a bit about that. Uh, and I think that the difference is just because there's so much data out there and your company is collecting it doesn't mean that you're tapping into your data asset as much as you could. And where companies should be really be thinking is what can they do to become not only a data driven company, but to build and foster and and continue to just promote a data-driven culture within their enterprise. And that's, I think, where is the, the companies that are at the forefront and are in the leaders, they're really thinking about data-driven culture, not just data in the ecosystem. Does that make sense? No, it, it, it does. And I, I really like how you make this distinction of one thing is collect data. Oh, we need to go get more data. Let's go catalog the data, see everything we have. I mean, yes, you can go do that, but then it's like, so what? I mean, at the end of the day, we need to understand uh, the different problems we need to go solve, but that is around the culture. Uh, and, and I think that's that's something that is, again, we talk about people, processes, and tools, and, and you got catalogs to the tools that are, that are needed to go collect data, but we really need to understand where the people and the process is coming around. I know we were having uh, our previous conversations. I love how you were going through this evolution of data and analytics uh, about like before in the before times, it was just, hey, just the strategic consultants would be go uh, will be the ones who are looking to the data. Share us a little bit about how how you've been living through that entire um, evolution. Yeah, I mean, well, anyone that has met me knows I am super passionate about data. I've built my entire career on data, and there has been an evolution of it. And so if I think back in early in my career, when I took my short foray out of sales and I went and did some strategic consulting at uh, McKinsey and Bain, that was when you know th there were these outside experts, these strategy consultants, consultants that you brought in to understand the data because it was too it was too complicated for people to do in house. Now, I mean, those consultants are still doing a ton with data, but then you went through this whole thing of like, what should companies even think about with regards to data? And so when I was early on, I was employee 10 at Tableau Software, and I was the first person in sales. And I remember when we started talking about data, now everyone says, well, should your company care about big data? Back when I started at Tableau, uh, wanted to, like, people didn't care about data. They didn't even care about little data, much less big data. They were, like, data was just kind of an afterthought. But then what ended up happening is, People started collecting all this data and storing the data, but they didn't know what to do with the data. So it started first if no one cared about data. Then it started with, well, we're going to collect and store the data. But if you collect and store the data and you don't do anything with it, it's not particularly useful. And so part of what our mission at Tableau was, what our mission was, we help people see and understand data. And so it was empowering people to be more self-sufficient uh, the whole data democratization of how do you empower people to be able to answer their own questions? Because there was this challenge, which was there's so much data, but there was a very finite group of people that understood how to power the systems that generated the answers. So you had to be an IT consultant, you had to be a DBA, you had to be a data scientist, and so then you had all these people that were what we called, you know, da data users, analysts, data enthusiasts, even just everyday business users, whether you were a marketer, a salesperson, a recruiter, 
even if you're thinking about outside of the business world, someone that is a teacher or a principal or a doctor or a nurse, people that had all this data and they were the domain experts and they didn't know how to ask questions and answer questions. So that was the next stage. You went from collecting data and storing data to then empowering people to be self-sufficient answering their own data. And now a lot of companies have embraced that, empowering people to have access to the data and to ask and answer their own questions. But now we're at the next stage of the evolution. And that next stage is there's so much data from so many diverse sources and data coming all the time from so many different places. And it's big data that now people, even if they have the power to be able to, to have some system or tool, they don't know what question to ask. So they end up going back to opinions and hunches because it's just too complicated to figure out all the questions to ask. And so now it's the next generation of the data evolution, store, collect, store, give access, empower people to ask and answer their own questions. But now there's this whole layer of AI on top of it, of how can you allow organizations to be able to be more autonomous and self-guided and to have more guidance in how people even think about answering questions with their data. That is really cool how you're painting sort of the evolution of how this has evolved. And, you know, I, I think we'd love to zoom in a little bit on a couple of these sort of tr evolution points. And so like, uh, you know, for example, companies that are kind of like stuck in this collection mode and that are now trying to move from sort of collection and storage to self-service. Um, what, what, what do you think are the big keys to success there? And then similarly, I think we're going to ask you about like, well, now how do you go from self-service to more like this broader intelligence? Well, Self-service takes a couple things. One is in order to enable people to ask and answer their own questions, they have to have access to the data. And there's some organizations that lock down the data so much. Now there's, you, we have to be appropriate with the data. You can't give all data to everyone, especially for those of us that are in public companies or affiliated with companies that are soon to be public. There's, there's all of this that you have to do to be thoughtful about who has your data because you can't have too much insider trading, all that. But some companies take that to too much of an extreme and then lock down so much of their data. And if we're going to empower people to have you know a data, data democratized environment or culture, then they have to have access to data. So I think number one is access to data. Once they have access, then are we giving them the tools to be able to interact with that data themselves and to be self-sufficient to have a conversation with that data and that requires companies to think about tools systems processes to enable the everyday user who might not be so technical to be able to have that interactive conversation with their data uh, i I'm, I'm very important key point here is having a conversation with the data and um I, my aha moment right now is it's not just about we want to have a bunch of data give me answers to questions I have because, yeah, we, we I mean, we should that that should be a given. We should be able to go do this right now. But there's just so many so much stuff out there that we need to start thinking about that. We don't even know what those questions could be. And I, I've been having actually a couple of conversations, hallway conversations here in this conference, is, 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 which is about that, about data driven hypothesis generation. It's like at this point is we have a bunch of data we're collecting is like, what are even the things that we could be asking? Like, what are the things that we don't know that we should be asking about that we should you know, that we should? This, this is where the machine should be able to come in and say, hey, I got a bunch of opinions and thoughts and the machine should come and saying, yeah, that's a, those are good ones. And here's the answers. But actually, you should be thinking about it this way or not. You should be like, here are these other possibilities. Right. So now you really step out of the box and kind of like, oh, wow, I didn't know this was possible. And this is just having a conversation with the data. Uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know. That's just, I'm just kind of connecting some dots uh, that I have in my head here, past conversations, and and I really like this about having conversations with the data. Yeah. Oh well, one. I think I three different things just popped up, and when you talked about that, so let's just go walk through what the three different ones are. One is 
having a conversation, an interactive conversation with the data. Many companies think about themselves as being data driven when they have someone in some group and some business intelligence group or some analytics group goes and creates a bunch of executive dashboards, a bunch of production dashboard, a series of reports that are generated and sent via email or Slack every day. And then there's a bunch of static reports. So that's useful. We're looking at the data. There are certain stats and metrics that you want to look at every single day. The challenge is that doesn't engage with an interactive conversation with the data. Because if, if people are really being data centric, what happens when you see a dashboard? When I see a dashboard or a KPI, I look at it, but then what happens? I look at it and then I have a whole bunch of questions around why that data is showing me that one specific number or that series of numbers. And so then it surfaces a whole bunch of additional questions. So to be data centric, it's not just about serving up the data in some kind of a static report, even if it's an interactive report that has a few predefined drill paths, it's then empowering people to say, hey, this is surfacing some information and now I want to be able to answer an additional follow-on question and then an additional follow-on question to get to that questioning and interrogation type of mode. Um, so that is what I mean, one, with conversation of the data. The second piece, Juan, which you touched on is how can you have this conversation where people don't really depend on the hunches? They have an idea and then how do you actually go drill into it? And this is what is the exciting part of where we are today with data is once a company does get to be self-sufficient with the data, then they can say, hunches are good. Opinions are good. We're hiring people in our organizations that actually have really good intuition, but we don't wanna just act on that intuition alone. We wanna be able to have the hunch, but then empower us to be able to ask the questions that we can go validate our hunches with facts. So that's the second piece. The third piece is when we talk about the future of where we're going with being more autonomous and guided, and maybe that's something that we go to later in the conversation. Well, I, you know, I, this autonomous and guided aspects, actually, I think something that's really interesting and kind of connects to the next step of this whole evolution, right? So you, you, you're talking about getting to self-service and having this conversation around data, having access to the data, then you want to be able to get more autonomous and guided around the data. You know, a question I would have for you around this, Kelly, is, 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 is the fact that we're having trouble getting data literacy and having these conversations around data a big driver of the need for autonomous and guided approaches? Um, you know, maybe I'll just start with that. Yeah, I think it's a little bit that way, but I, I would probably frame it differently. I would frame it that there's so much data. There's diversity of data because you have data coming from your transactional systems, from what people are doing with social media, with all the different touch points that you have with your customers, with all of your employee data, all your financial data, and you go on and on and on marketing data. There's so, so much data that are coming from all these different apps, all these different systems. So yes, there is something of there's so much data. It's big, it's complex. What do you do with it? I think the other piece though is because there's so many systems, there's also certain systems that are dependent on human beings actually entering the data into the system. So for instance, let's take CRM for, for or any, any CRM system that a company uses. The CRM is supposed to be the single source of truth of all of your customer data, but it's heavily dependent on what the reps put into the system. And the reps are so busy, they don't have time to put everything in. So they like, if they're not going to enter in all their emails, enter in all their calls, enter in their notes from every Zoom interaction that they had or every single web conference that they had, then you don't have a complete view of the data in those systems. So we're collecting a whole bunch of data, but then some data is dependent on what you're putting in. So even though you think you have a lot of data, the data is often incomplete. And so part of the way to think about the AI is how can you have a holistic system where it's going through all of your interactions and it's pulling all of those data to really create 
a true version of reality. And this is one of the reasons I joined Gong. I'm so excited about what we're doing here because whether or not you're interacting with your customer on, on a web conferencing platform or on email or on a call or in Slack or whatever it might be, text, we're collecting all of that data. So you actually have clear visibility on that data. So the first is collecting the real single source of truth where it is full visibility. And then next you have, well, now that you have it, how can we layer autonomous guidance on top of it to be able to help people to ask those questions or get directions on what they should do with the data, where it might be something they didn't even know to ask. So th that's really interesting and compelling, Kelly, because it sounds like when you talk about this sort of autonomous and guided layer, it's not just an add-on at the end of this, right? It's not just like, okay, collection, storage, self-service, now let's pop our uh, autonomous and, and sort of guided intelligence on top of that. It sounds like you're talking about how that can impact actually all parts of this even all the way to collection, right? If if you're if CRM data collection is not effective right now, that you know garbage in, garbage out. Actually, that autonomy and guided approach can affect that aspect of the platform as well. I, I think that's where we're when we're thinking about the evolution. Everyone first was okay. We're going to manually go put all the data in. We're going to tie all our data together. We're going to use all these different whether you know it's ETF. Well, all these different systems to put data in. And we're going to assume all the data is there. And now we're going to empower people to have conversations with their data. And that was super important. But now we have to all recognize data is growing and changing and evolving so quickly. It's just, it's never going to work that we're going to manually or even systematically by just using APIs and add-ons, put all the data there. So this is a way that AI can really help to serve up the true visibility and the rea reality of what's happening with all that data. So that's the first way to use AI. Another way to use AI is, well, is there some regular pattern matching that I can just serve up the same thing all the time? So I know that, like for instance, in sales, I know reps are always going to want to know what's going on with this coaching, what what is coming next in terms of their sales playbook. You can say the same thing for marketing or product. So certain predefined questions that you always want to ask, AI helps with that too. And then the third piece is how do we help to serve up insights from that data that are from questions that people may not even know how to ask or, or insights from the data where someone has an idea of they want to look at this category or this topic, but they don't actually even know how to evaluate it. And that's where we're going to see the future of data going. I, I appreciate how you're being very concrete on this. And let me go repeat this to see how if I if I if I got this. I, I mean, and we just ended up now talking about AI, which is really exciting. So I see this as two parts. One is about helping build and create the data, and all the other part is making use of it, right? Kind of how we do how do we maximize the use of the data? So on that first part in creating the data. I mean, we're always going to have so many disparate systems and, and and silos and all that stuff. And even if we think that this is going to be the CRM or whatever is going to be our master system, there's always going to be some other stuff that is not going to get in there. And so it's never truly going to be one single source of truth or whatever, because it, it, there's other sources that go complement that. And it's it's going to be growing. Like today, we'll, we'll, we can decide that we're going to go connect all this stuff together. But tomorrow, there's going to be new stuff in there, right? So and somehow, we want to be able to go create some automation. This is where the AI can go help. I think something that, that uh, Gong does really cool is that it does all this, again, not to get too salesy, but again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Gong, is... Uh, let me go do all the analysis on the transcripts on how people are. You can go see the sentiment of stuff. You can go see when people are talking about it. like you start reading, learning so much, not about the customer, but also then about the, the employees and learn and code for coaching. So there's just so much stuff to go do there. So this whole first part is about how can we truly start creating that X 360 X call it the customer, the employee. Right. Um, and we need to have AI to bring all that data together. So that's that first part. And then the, on the second it's how do we do? How do we use AI to help us get more value out of the data? And the two ways of the, of doing this is one is, hey, there's this stuff that we ask over and over again, basically kind of predefined questions, and and I don't want to have to manually go to ask these questions. Like you should automate this for me. Like this is something I already know that you're already expecting me to go. I'm, you're expecting me to go ask this question. Just give it to me. And the and the other part to that is 
I don't even know what to ask. And it goes back to the, my previous point of like this, like some data driven hypothesis generation or just I'm generating the questions that, hey, you should be asking me like you didn't know that you should be asking me here. Like, go ask these questions and I gave you a bunch of them. Now, which ones do you actually care about? Let's go solve them. I just ranted a lot, but I, I mean, this is because you really clearly or I, I understood that I understood this from the AI part that you were talking about. Any yeah, I think all of those, I'd agree with all three of those. I I nuanced the middle one a little bit because the way you said it is, hey, when people know that there's questions just like serving up the answers, that to me sounds like a predefined KPI or a dashboard. I'd say that that is something that's important, but that was something that, you know, like Tableau or other BI systems could help with. Uh, now what's happening is it's less about just having the predefined metric. It's more of, if there's a category of questioning that you know that you want to have, having AI kind of put a wrapper around that. So it helps just serve up to people what they should do without them even having to lift a finger. Uh, so for instance, in Gong, you know, there's certain things around coaching or deal management that we just know that all of our customers are asking for. So you can kind of serve it up. The third category is, well, I don't know at your company exactly what your strategic priority is. Um, but now if you tell me it's really important, like you want to understand what's going on with you, you have a strong competitor. You want to understand what's happening all the time when your customers are talking about that competitor, or you just did a price change and you want to know how that's landing with your customers and your prospects. Then you can actually put in some kind of word of like, I'm tracking what is happening when when this competitor name's coming up or when someone's talking about a price differential and then you use AI to say, well, what are all the different words that would be price and how do I actually serve up some insights of like a tracker of what's happening around that universe and that category of insight. So those are how I kind of uh, tailor down those last two buckets a little bit more. Well, I have a related question to this automation kind of conversation, and I'm, I'm curious, Kelly, what your take is just based on what you've said about AI and automation and how you're leveraging it at a gong, but how you've seen it evolve. Um, you know, how much are you seeing that this application of AI, it can be sort of general versus sort of domain specific, right? So in the case of, of, you know, Gong, the most common use case being around sales, right? And sort of like, like, for example, you mentioned the sales playbook and stuff like that. That's like that sales speak, right? Um, versus like company specific, like mm -hmm. I'm a snowflake, you know, like only like I have to configure everything because it's just me, right? Um, just kind of curious on, on, on how you feel about that spectrum and, and how, you know, automation and analytics can apply to that. Mm. Okay, well, this is a, a broad sentiment of what you just said. Sometimes people are thinking about data in one bucket. What are we doing with data? What are we doing with our company's information? How can we empower people to be more self-sufficient with the data? How can we think about data democratization? It's over here in one bucket. And then they're having a whole different conversation of, huh, the future of AI. What can we do with machine learning? What can we do with AI? any ways that we can be automating things, helping people to be more productive. And it's over here in a different bucket. And there is such tremendous power when you think about merging those two worlds, when you think about, hey, you have so much data. And I mean, I always talk about the, the top asset in an organization is their people, of course, people, people, people are what do everything after people I mean, of course you have your customers, you have all these other things that are super important, but data is such a key asset. And what happens is many companies are thinking about how can they make the most out of their information and their data? And that's an important question to ask, but sometimes you're doing it too much in a vacuum without thinking about just the same way people are saying, how, how can I empower my people to be more productive, my systems, my supply chain, whatever, to be more effective with AI, we should be asking the question of how can we get more out of this super robust data asset by leveraging what our strategy is as a company with machine learning and AI and combining that with data to be able to empower people, not only to answer their own questions with data, but to help tell them what to do when 
based on all this data that we've collected over the history of time. Does that make sense, Tim? I, I think so. I think so. And 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 it sounds like you're you're kind of proposing a, a different way to sort of frame frame the situation here. That it's less about sort of you know general versus industry versus company specific, and it's more about um, sort of driving towards action and leveraging your data and your people to do that. I mean, I, I think if I, if I think about what we're doing, for instance, at Gong, is we want to understand what is the true reality and then being able to empower people to be more successful, whether it is it within their sales and revenue organization, whether it's within their company, whether it's in whatever group, product, marketing, sales, wherever. And then when you're looking at that data, you're looking at data, not only your internal data, not only your sales data, but your market data, your company data. So I think it's all kind of blends together. I don't think you can really say, well, how should we be thinking about just our company data uh, or our functional data and then our company data and then our market data? Because this is where companies kind of get into, that's a challenge. If they go and silo those data too much, then you're not getting all of the benefit to be able to look at that whole data asset together. That, that makes sense. And then I guess just one more double click on this topic before we do another one is, I, I guess the last thing that I'm trying to figure out is, you know, like just let's pick on sales for a second, right? And so you've got like one company calls it a deal. You, they call it an opportunity. This other group calls it a, you know, an engagement. And, you know, I guess that that's just a very specific example of where different companies might have a different way to approach it. And I've always kind of thought as some of these semantics issues and some of these sort of choices as things that can be a barrier to sort of automation and adoption, you know, automation and AI to be effective. Um, and I, I was kind of curious, like, is part of the reason that like companies like Gong, for example, can can address that is because they are actually involved in the collection of the data. And so you can actually kind of unify it around a sort of a, a you know, a consistent approach. Whereas if somebody was like, you know what? I'm just going to recreate Gong with Tableau and I'm just going to like make it myself right on top of my data warehouse or something like that, that like you're, 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 you're not only are you losing the intelligence that comes with like smart collection and things like that, but also you're not benefiting with all these sort of the three different paths around AI that you're putting around that common set of semantics. I guess, yeah. does that make sense? Uh, hopefully that's not a, too weird of a question. Yeah. I, I, I think I understand where you're going with that. I think that, so much of this, when I talk about the data evolution, so much of it has really been focused on serving up what the view of reality is. So what is the reality? Surface up visibility. We've already talked about with all the, the rapidly changing pace of data, there is a challenge with what, how clear and how um, complete is that version of reality. And this mm -hmm. is one of the first things that Gong does really well is because we can go grab all of the information without anyone having to do anything. We just go collect it and it's all there. It's actually a very comprehensive, complete set of that of the data to make it show that it's clear visibility, it provides clarity, and it is the entire view of the reality. So that's the first piece where companies are struggling with when things are changing so quickly. This is what happened back in the days when I was at Tableau. Sometimes we'd go have a conversation with someone and they'd say, hey, we'd love to use Tableau, but we're not quite ready. It's going to take us three years to put together our data warehouse. And we'd say, OK, it's going to take you three years to put down your data warehouse with what you have now. But in three years, you're going to have hundreds, thousands, millions times more data than you have today. And so then everything that you're putting in place now for three years later it's going to be obsolete then. And that's what companies want to make sure. Are they looking at the full version of the truth? So that's what I'm talking about with visibility. On the autonomous side, it is really of, because it, it can get com confusing. Like think about how many times people have said they get to analysis paralysis. They want to go ask every question. They want to go look at everything. And they don't, one, don't know how to ask the question. Two, Everyone's talking about the dirty data. Well, this data and that data, you mentioned it. There's sales, there's deal, there's opportunity. If you leverage and tap into AI, you can actually train the system that all three of those things, your deal and your opportunity, those are the same words. And now you can bring that together in a much faster way than you'd be able to go build it manually in something 
you know, like a data warehouse or a Tableau. Wow, this my mind's growing. This is so much, so much stuff here. I, I yeah, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking a bunch I'm, of notes just based you know, on like processing I'm, this all. This is awesome. I, I wrote down this phrase here: is you want to understand what is a true reality, so you can empower users so they can be successful. They need to understand what this reality is, and and I think it's not just about like the, we always talk about the 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 single source of truth and everything is, but there is a reality out there that we may agree, we may disagree on it. We just need to know what that is. And then once we put all that data together, but based on kind of th that knowledge, right? So if we're talking about a customer, we know that these things happen around a customer. We, we talk about uh, a deal. We know these things happen around a deal and a customer is related to a deal. So this is kind of those high level categories that you start seeing. And you know, I want to understand all this data that's around these particular topics. So this is something that, I, that you're, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this. But one thing I do want to touch is, is, about maximizing the value of this data. So we have, I, I always do the magic wand, the magic wand exercise. So we have, uh, 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 we're in a position of time right now where we have this true reality of the data. We want to empower people to be more successful. What does that actually look like? Like, let, 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 I want to ground that a little bit more into kind of reality. Like, can you give us some examples that you've seen uh, in, in your experience of how people are actually maximizing their value when they, once they have all this data really well connected? Yeah, well, I, I can give some examples of just what we're doing here. The way we talk about it is we talk about it here at Gong of unlock reality. And if you think about it, oftentimes reality is very locked. It's like there's data somewhere. People don't know what to do with it. So what do we mean by this tangibly? Okay, so giving a few examples. There's a whole, uh, and you know, I, I'm, I'm a salesperson, so I'll, I'll give sales examples. So there's a whole slew of sales people and sales reps, and they're going and having a whole bunch of conversations. Now I can look in my CRM and I can see what are, what are in this stage, what are close to closing, what are actually closed one, what are closed lost. And if a deal works well, or if one team's doing better than another team, I can go and ask and say, well, what happened? And then people give me a whole bunch of explanations. Now I can see what's in the system, what is the reason that the rep wrote in that the deal came out? I can hear what they're saying is what happened with the conversation with the customer. I can maybe even go listen to a, a customer conversation. But if I want to see pattern matching of what is actually happening, it's hard for me to understand. And if I want to unlock reality, now think about a system where I have all of those calls, all of those emails, all of the Slack, all of the text, all of the Zoom video calls, all the WebEx and taking all of those customer conversations, pulling it into a system where now it actually tells me everything that's happening in all of my customer conversations. And I want to understand, well, what is happening for those deals where they're winning versus those deals that they're losing? And maybe I can look at what's happening with this certain competitive track. What's happening with the pricing? Is the rep actually talking about our playbook? Like an interesting thing, we companies can say, hey, we just launched a new playbook. And for those reps who are using the playbook, are they selling more than those reps who are not? So rather than just going with the hunch, it's actually pure data, which you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't wrap AI on top of it. Uh, you, you, you've painted a, a, a true picture of kind of a few future, but I know that this is not future. I know this is reality uh, with you guys. And I love your whole term of unlock reality about this. Um, yeah, that, that's a that's a phrase that I'm thinking a lot about as well. And and, and I like that our conversation has um, painted, uh, painted a sort of AI less of this thing that you're adding on top. Like, like people always tend to talk about AI, at least it's the fun thing to do. Like it's like rocket science that like goes on the end of it and just like makes everything really exciting, you know? And, and when you ground it in unlock reality, it's about like, we're just trying to get to the truth of the matter so, and then take action on it. And it's, it's much, a much more practical perspective. I feel like. Well, well, Tim, I think there's one, one more thing to talk about. So we've talked about how you unlock reality and, it shows the whole version of, uh, it gives visibility and clarity on what is truly happening. We've talked about the autonomous piece too. The third piece that is really important if we go back on to your initial question about data-driven cultures is companies 
are trying to drive alignment in their organization. You have to have alignment. You have to have like the sales team is thinking the same thing as marketing. Products thinking the same as go to market. All of your executives are aligned. People are on the same page. And what happens is when people are not clear on what is the true visibility and you can't unlock reality, then everyone kind of makes their own hunches and they go their own ways. And then it gets to be people are operating with different versions of the truth. And then it drives misalignment and it creates more silos and people go in different ways. So the other thing that people often aren't thinking about when there's when considering the importance of data driven culture, one, we've talked about tapping into the asset. Two, we've talked about empowering people to be more self-sufficient and productive in their work so that they can not only have that interactive conversation with the data, but they can actually tap into the data to serve up the right information at the right time to make them more productive and efficient. The third is how do you actually drive improved communication, collaboration, and alignment, which is some people don't realize is so tightly dependent on having good cohesive data strategy and a data-driven culture. So talking about culture here for a second, and, and this is a, this is always a hot topic right now. Um, I'm always curious about how, one of the conversations we were having a lot is about uh, decentralization, centralization of data, of, of, of the people who do the data work and move that down closer to kind of the domains of, of sales and finance and marketing. I, how have you been seeing kind of the, the, the cultures evolving and, and what are best practices, what are do's and don'ts that you've seen over your career when it comes to establishing data cultures? Well, the first is being thoughtful about access and being, although we have to lock down some of the data, how can you actually empower people to have enough access to data to be able to do their job? I think that's the first piece. The second is oftentimes people think that, or, or I would say now it's changing, but that if people aren't technical, that they aren't interested in interacting with their data. And it's just not true. Everyone's interested in interacting with their data. Whatever domain you are, whatever function you are, people are very, uh, can work much faster. Like for instance, if you're a recruiter, I need to know how, how many people have I talked to? What, what are the different salaries that I'm giving people? Who's accepting? Who's not? I need to be able to know that on the sales side. If I'm on the product, I need to have data to understand, you know, what are my customers saying? What's happening? Even if you're not in business, it, you know, think about even someone that is like a little league coach for their kids. They want to look at the data and all the stats. So I think it is a mental shift to believe that everyone actually is a data user. Everyone is a knowledge worker and everyone should care about data and information. And how are you empowering those people that have questions to do their work? How are you empowering them to get that work done without having to depend and rely on someone that's highly specialized in a different group? So I think that's the second piece. I think the third piece is how are we continuing to use our data to help people be more effective and more productive so that they can work faster. And that's where a lot of, for instance, what Gong is doing is think about onboarding. People are onboarded, they go through two weeks of training. Are they actually benefiting for that training? How are managers helping them to ramp faster? Everyone's always talking about they want to ramp faster. Well, what if you had a system that now every manager could go in and hear what people are saying, see what they're doing, and then you can be faster. It's just making everyone be much more productive. And I think the fourth, which some people don't even think about, is when people are empowered to answer their own questions and to work faster and more effectively, not only are they more productive, they just, they like their job better. They, they enjoy what they're doing. They're more passionate about being able to get their job done. Like I remember, I'll give you two stories. At like, for instance, at Tableau, I remember some of the most compelling stories weren't when people said, hey, I was able to actually see this story um, or build this dashboard that helped me be more productive at work. No, what people would say is, I was having so much trouble getting my job done, it would have to take me 10 hours a day, 
every day to tap into this. And then I used Tableau and I could do what took me 40 hours in like literally 10 minutes. And now it freed up my time and I could go have dinner with my kids every night. And what this empowerment of data allowed me to get my life back and to spend more time with my family. And that was very inspiring. Another story you have here at Gong is someone will say, I just, you know, I was a manager. I'm a manager, a sales manager. And I just really wanted to be able to ramp all of my people faster and know I was doing everything possible to make them more successful at their jobs. And I've tried everything. And now that I've used Gong, I just, I love my job and it's empowering me as a manager to have a growth mindset and for me to get better and for me to onboard everyone on my team better. And it just, it makes me so much better and it makes me passionate that I can make everyone on my team thrive in a way that they couldn't before. And both of those are really personal stories. They're not all this ROI stuff, which is important too, of course, but data and unlocking reality empowers people to be more inspired and more passionate and have more fun at what they're doing every day. And even if all the other reasons didn't matter, companies should have a data-driven culture just because of that. Uh, this is this is brilliant. What you just this is a, a I mean this is a the the three minute uh, snippet that everybody should be listening to over and over again. I just love what you just said here, and. In particular, I've had this conversation with other people about um, when you want to go, uh, when you're hiring people and you think about people coming out right now into the workforce. And it's like, where do, where would you like to go work at? I'm going to work at a place where everything is locked down. I have everything is just spreadsheets being emailed around or I want to work at a place where they have a fantastic data infrastructure. They know the people who own stuff. I know who to go ask the questions and stuff like that. Like, where would you want to go work? I mean, I think people are going to get more excited to go work at a place where they have a really great culture around when it comes to data and stuff. So uh, having your data in order is is not just a technical problem you need to go solve right now. It is going to be part of how you're going to go hire the best people, how you're going to retain the best people within your organization. And yes, we need to be customer centric and customer obsessed, but we I would actually argue that I want to be more employee obsessed because we need to keep the employees super happy and to be loving the product, loving the company because they're going to be happy. They're going to be delivering uh, amazing things for the customers and so forth. So it, I love how the culture is is not just I mean, yeah, we got to think about the ROI and the money and everything. But it, it's it's a personal stories too, and I I talk to people it's like so what keeps you up at night like what's the true pain point, and sometimes they're just like I have to do all this stuff which is so boring it takes me forever and I want to just come earlier and spend more time with my family I mean and that keeps me up at night because I can't spend time with my family like I, I mean it kind of sounds cheesy but it's not I mean it, it, it's not cheesy this is the this is the reality it goes back to your thing like this is the true reality and we go through it's not just about data and technology there's a whole people and the culture stuff anyway you got me so excited about this this is this i really loved your comment here well you know what i think the interesting part is the people and empowering people to answer their own questions and to do their own work and to work faster all of that is so inspiring for our teams in terms of hiring and retaining our, our talent at the same time, it's super compelling for our customers too. Because if you think about our customers, the worst thing that can happen, you, you know when you, you have an issue at like some vendor, like maybe it's uh, whoever provides your cell phone or something that goes on with your cable, and you call up and they ask you a whole bunch of questions and then you get disconnected and then you call back and then you have to explain it all again. And it's so frustrating. It's like this vendor doesn't even understand who I am. They don't even understand like who their customer is. And the thing is, it's empowering for our talent, but it's super empowering and creates these raving fans for our customers too. When we talk to our customers, our customers want to know we understand them. We care about them. We've done the research, we invest. And some companies, because they don't have this data-driven culture, they, they, they wouldn't even know where to start. They don't even have all the information in one place to serve it up to whoever's talking to the customer. They have all these different systems, they don't blend, nothing's serving up the insight. So again, a story that happens, like at, for instance, at Gong, is sometimes we'll have our customers where someone's gone and they've listened to the calls, they've run through all the trackers, 
They've listened to what other people who have interacted with the customers, what they've said in their customer conversations. And so when they interact with the customer, the customer will say, wow, I've never even talked to you before. You know everything about me. You truly understand what my issues are and how you can help. And that helps to create loyalty with their customers. It helps to create raving fans. And it helps go back one to what you talked about is it's people to people. And it's so much easier to forge those ties people to people if you actually understand what's happening and you have clear visibility into what the reality of the situation is. And so it's true everywhere we go, culture internally and culture externally. Yeah. Oh, man, we can keep talking for hours and hours about this. I'm so excited. Like, And I love your energy. And I have to say, I really love how you are you organize your thoughts and you're very, very kind of punctual in telling how things are. So thank you so much about this. Um, we got to, you said it's an hour. It's almost flying by here. We want to go to our lightning round session here. So All right, a, lightning a round. couple of questions. All right. So I'll go first. Yes or no. Is the future of AI for analytics vertical, such as for sales, for customer success, et cetera? It's for everyone. It's not just vertical. Okay. So second question. Uh, as part of self-service data being realized, right? Will everyone in a company have access to a BI tool? I think it's hard to say BI. Business intelligence is kind of like an antiquated term in a way. I think if it is empowering your people with systems and tools where everyone could actually answer their own questions and tap into that data in one way or another, yes, everyone should have that. Will everyone have a tool that is in some kind of category, categorized as BI, I think that's too narrow of a question. I like your nuance there. All right, uh, third question. Can technology help a company improve their data culture? Yes. Yes, Good. explanation mark. We just talked about it with Tableau and Goff, of course. <laughs> but I think that's a little bit of a layup. I mean, I work at data software companies, so of course the answer is yes. Some people, well, yeah, but some people are so adamantly against that concept in the sense that they're like, like, no, nah, it's a people and a culture problem, right? And it's like, okay, oh, well, crap. here's the thing. If you uh, well, we're in a technology it, business, but <laughs> you know what? If you can solve your data problem just with people without any systems or tools, that would be very interesting. I'd love to see it. Maybe people keep it all up here in their head. <laughs> There's Talk a, about a silo, mind, right? mind change. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, final question for you in the lightning round here. Will everyone become a data worker? Like, will we actually achieve all companies getting to this? Everyone's a data worker vision. I think already everyone is a data worker and companies just haven't embraced that yet. Everyone is a data worker. And if you think about it, it's not only true, like just in work. I mean, I think about it with everyone that I interact with. I think about it for my kids. If, if my kids want something, they want a new pair of shoes or they want to justify a vacation, they come up with a whole bunch of data. They've done their benchmarking and they've served up the pricing. And they, so they, everyone has a data culture. If you think about every function in a, in a company, sales, marketing, product, HR, finance, recruiting, everyone's looking at data. And, and this is, I think, part of what we're talking about, like going back to Gong, when we talk about unlock reality and the question you just asked me of, is it verticalized? Some people would say, oh, maybe you just do that for sales. But if you're gonna do it for sales and it drives empowerment, it helps provide clarity, it drives alignment. If you do it in sales, why shouldn't we be doing that in marketing? Why shouldn't we be doing that in customer success? Why shouldn't we be doing it in tech support? Why shouldn't we be doing it in product? Why shouldn't we be doing it in HR? And the list goes on and on and on. And so. Everyone in a company is a data worker. Everyone is using and has access to data at all times. And people want to be able to be empowered to answer their own questions and to work more productively if they can. And so everyone's a data worker in my book. I, I love that as a, as a big takeaway from this, right? Everyone is a data worker. And if you're not thinking that way, you should start thinking that way. Yeah, and how can you, if, if you believed that everyone was a data worker, are you doing what you need to do in your company to empower everyone to actually behave as a data worker? And if your answer is no, then that probably means that you can continue on your journey of being a data-driven culture. 
Yeah. This is your test for you and your organization. Are you meeting the bar? Exactly. And even if you are meeting the bar, the world is changing so quickly. We're never done. All- <laughs> Don't rest. <laughs> There's yeah. more to do. More to do always. <laughs> well, this is this is a great way to go to our TTT. Tim takes it away with takeaways. Go first, yeah. Tim. We, got, well, we so have we a bunch of notes here. <laughs> so much good stuff here. So we'll try to be brief. Uh, I'll, I'll make three takeaway points and then pass it to you, Juan. So first of all, we talked about how AI can help, uh, you know, around analytics, around your data. And you mentioned sort of three key ways it can. One was creating a holistic approach to creating a true version of reality. Uh, the second was, you know, can I automate things uh, in a way that helps people answer questions, um, you know, that isn't sort of a predefined approach, right? It's taking more of a categorical approach. Uh, and then also, can I help serve up insights that people didn't even know that they needed, right? That we can actually get in front of these key decisions. And, and I, I love the way that you kind of broke down some of the different ways that AI can help. You talked a lot about true reality and how we can unlock reality and do so in, in as autonomous a way as possible. Uh, and then finally, you talked a bunch about culture, right? Being able to empower people with access, being able to know that like creating a great data culture doesn't mean just empowering the technical people. It means empowering the less technical folks as well and turning everybody into a data worker, right? I, I think about that phrase knowledge worker that we use all the time, like data worker, knowledge worker, it's really uh, kind of related, right? If we want to empower everyone to actually become knowledgeable, to be actionable, we need to empower everyone to be an effective data worker. So and, what, and, what about you, Juan? Well, the, the main theme here is about, I think, true reality, understand true reality, and everyone's a data worker. I love how we went through this evolution, right? The, at the beginning, we didn't even care about data. It was an afterthought. Then we started collecting and storing data, but we weren't doing much about, about that with that data. Then we started empowering self, being self-sufficient, right? Things like Tableau and data democratization come along. But then... Uh, then we just now have so much data. We don't even know all the questions that we can ask. And like right now we're in this position that we need to be have uh, where AI can come in and help us figure out what are those questions we should be asking. And I truly love this whole conversation we had about conversations with the data, right? Uh, our initial version of being data driven was just having kind of that, having a, a static report and you can go in, maybe could drill down a little bit, but then you'd have all these follow-up questions. So you want to be able to be very self-sufficient to be able to go answer those new questions, uh, hypotheses you have and validate them. And the future is having this all autonomous and guided. That's, that's a lot there. <laughs> that's a lot that we discussed here. Kelly, let me throw it back to you. Two questions. One, what's your advice about life, about data, open-ended? And second, who should we invite next? Yes. Uh, Well, my advice, you know, often in these, we talk about all these things, data, reality, autonomous, AI, uh, sales, all these different things. But I think a lot of it does come back to one thing I mentioned earlier is just how are we thinking about our people as our greatest asset and then empowering those people? To our, empowering our people to be able to thrive, hiring the best people, allowing them to, to do their best work, bring their authentic self. And everyone's always focusing so much on operational efficiencies. How are we thinking about our people? And as we think about our people, so much of, our, of helping our people be empowered and thrive is about allowing them to get those tools to help them be better to work on their growth mindset, to continue to, to grow and develop, to be able to have access to the right data. And data really unlocks all of that. And so there's lots of other things you can do to really serve, to be able to be great culture companies for your people, but data is definitely a core one of them. So that, that's what I'd say, all about the people and data actually helps build that culture. The second in terms of who should you have next? You know, we, we had our annual Celebrate event last week. And one of my favorite parts that we had brought in from the outside was we had Dan Pink on um, at, as a speaker there. And I don't know if you could get him on the Catalog and Cocktails uh, podcast, but he's, it was so refreshing to, to hear about this whole body of work, which really is all centered around data. It's all centered around drive, motivation, timing, and all the research with data 
that shows how you can actually optimize all these things around people and motivation and, and how you get your most out of everyone there, all driven in data. And that's what we're all talking about. It was super interesting. I love that suggestion. I'm a huge Dan Pink fan. I've loved the whole mastery autonomy purpose that he kind of re really became famous for and then all his books that have come out since then. So uh, great, great suggestion. Kelly, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating discussion and I look forward to meeting you in person sooner and later and continue having these conversations. Thank you for all the very valuable insights that you've shared with us today. Well, thank you, Juan and Tim. And you know what? It's been a pleasure over the years to work with Data.World. And I've just, I've loved every part of the interaction. And so thank you for inviting me here today. And thank you listeners for tuning in. Awesome. Cheers. Have a great one. Cheers, Kelly. Cheers.